Hello again, Rush Church. We are, uh, I say Rush Church, I always say Rush Church. I guess it could be anybody, whether you're part of the body here or not. Um, certainly welcome to participate in these studies, and I hope that you do. I hope you continue to study on your own what you can read and what you can read. This, this, this accumulation of knowledge of who and what Christ is. Um, remember, knowledge is, is, is not the end. That's not um, completely what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to get here. What you're trying to get through the Word of God is understanding that we are to develop the character of Christ in our lives. And it's only by doing that that we actually live out our, our purpose and our mission, uh, our meaning here in life. Um, and, and it's also to gain wisdom. Uh, you, can have, you can have a lot of knowledge, which is the accumulation of fact, but if you don't know how to properly apply that knowledge, uh, then you don't have wisdom. And that's really what we're, what we're getting at. Uh, so we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. We're in week nine now, uh, and we'll continue until we're done with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but, I, you know, if this is uh, the first time that you've listened to one of these studies, if you're, if you're going through and, and uh, kind of you know, picking and choosing a couple of different uh, uh, videos, that's perfectly fine. But you need to remember that all of these things, everything that, that Jesus is talking about, builds on itself. It's all based upon uh, where he starts in the Beatitudes. And so much of what we read and, and much of what we, what we understand, we're not going to fully understand until we see the whole thing and we see it in its proper context. Uh, very often we want to maybe see a, we'll see a lesson or we'll see a video uh, on one subject, you know, on murder, or on divorce, or on oaths, or whatever it is, and we'll click on that, and 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 we'll we'll watch the video or listen to the lesson. But remember, you're only even then you're only getting a part of it. Uh, in order for you to fully understand where Jesus is coming from, I think you need to see the entire lesson, and the entire lesson is the Sermon on the Mount. If we don't uh, understand, if we don't you know, foster in our lives the truth of being poor in spirit, uh, mourning over our sin, uh, you know, being humble, and all of these things. Well, there's a lot of stuff that Jesus teaches that we're not going to want to receive. Um, we fight him on this. We fight a lot of people, uh, a lot of teachers, on reading the Word of God and teaching. Because we don't like what it says. There's a lot of times in the Word we don't like what it says. Why don't we like what it says? Well, because it, it rubs against, it grates against our pride. It grates against ease of life sometimes and comfort. It demands that we examine ourselves and realize that we're not perfect and we've made mistakes. It also shows us that, that I, I don't set the bar. You don't set the bar of morality in your life. Uh, Jesus does. You know, his life, his character, God, your creator, uh, really sets this bar of morality. Um, and these are all things that we need to aspire to. Now, if you try to do that on your own, it's not going to work. If you try to take in and apply the teachings of Christ without honoring Christ in your life, none of this is going to work. Uh, you just you're just going to disagree with them, and you're going to move on with life uh, and uh, forget about some of the hard teachings uh, that Jesus gives us. So we do need to understand and realize that Jesus is God. We are not as God. He determines the way His creation is meant to exist. Whether you like it or not, doesn't really matter. The Creator determines how His creation is meant to exist. And it's meant to exist in these ways because it is beneficial for you and I. Um, 
it, it, it glorifies God, but it, it helps you and it helps me. Um, some of the teaching that Jesus that Jesus teaches or some of the lessons he has, we even have record in Scripture of people saying, hey, look, this is just too hard for me. I'm, I'm out. You know, thanks a lot, Jesus. You go your way. I'll go mine. Um, but I'm not going to follow this. It's just too hard for me to follow. It's too hard for me to give my life over to. I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. It's difficult. There's all kinds of things. Well, that's the sad part. And, and, and that's, a, that's a place that you don't want to find yourself. Giving up on living after Christ uh, because there's something that you either don't agree with or something that's difficult. The goal is to change. Change our character. You know, if we come in to a lesson, if we come into a study of the Word of God and we leave uh, the same way that we showed up, uh, I, I think we've missed something. I think we've missed the point of that study and the lessons that Jesus teaches. And so uh, we need to remember that not all of it is, is fun and easy. And I, I think we see that through the Sermon on the Mount. You know, when we're comparing murder uh, to anger and hatred, when we're comparing adultery to lust, uh, all of these things are, are really uh, raising that moral bar in our lives. And today we look at, uh, we're going to try to look at three. We may only get to two, uh, divorce and oaths, uh, both of which I think are, um, are forgotten about sometimes. Um, we look around at the culture in which we live and we use that to determine uh, you know what uh, what holy living is uh, instead of looking at the eternal and unchanging Word of God and uh, so I you know we're confronted with some of these these hardships these hard truths but we need to take them as truth and we need to be changed internally um, and so we start with divorce here we start with um, chapter 5 uh, verse 31 Again, remember, we've gone through murder and adultery. We've gone through the Beatitudes, that is, uh, blessed, the blessed, um, and also the fact that we are salt and light. And remember, with all of this is Jesus reaffirming that he is the fulfillment of the law. This is, this is, this is great for you and I. Jesus fulfills the law in two ways. Number, uh, a number of ways. He, he fulfills the sacrificial law. He fulfills the moral law, which is what we're talking about here, and he also fulfills the judicial law. Um, but he he brings uh, to light what the Old Testament law was always pointing to, and the reason some of these things were put into place. And one of these, I, I, we have a great example today when he talks about divorce. He starts this out in verse thirty-one. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Well, it has been said. Uh, they've, they've read that in uh, the Old Testament. They've read that in the books of the law. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, which we're going to get to here in a second. Um, and, and it's been said in their day, uh, the day of Christ. You know, if you're going to divorce uh, your wife, you need to give her a certificate of divorce. And divorce your wife, by the way. You know, wives didn't have the option in that time, in that day, to determine divorce and not divorce and that type of thing. So this is, this is written specifically to men, but certainly applies to men and women today. Um, but in Deuteronomy, we find this, Deuteronomy uh, 24, verse 1, I think. And Deuteronomy is really a retelling of the law. The law is laid out in Exodus and Leviticus. Um, and, and Deuteronomy is kind of retold, summarized, sort of. Um, but in Deuteronomy 24, this is part of the law. This is part of the word of God. If a man marries a woman, starting in verse 1, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, that's important. Becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent. Not just something he doesn't like, but something that is indecent. Something indecent about her. 
and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. If after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after, uh, after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land of the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. It is clear if you read through the Sermon on the Mount, particularly this, this part, this place, that, that God does not like it when a man and a woman get divorced, when they, they join their lives together and everything that comes along with that. Uh, whether it's uh, physical relationships, whether it's families, children, homes. God doesn't like the fact that that splits up sometimes and breaks up sometimes. So why in the world in the Old Testament would he tell them that if you're going to divorce your wife, again, once again, remember, wives didn't have any say in this, right? And actually, that's important to remember right now. Um, why, if you divorce your wife, do you have to give her a certificate of divorce? Well, leading up to this place and up to this point, there really was divorce, separation, uh, breakups of marriages just running rampant. Uh, not through, you know, not only through different places and parts and people and cultures in the world, but throughout the Israelite nation. And it would be, uh, you know, this separation from husband and wife for many, many different reasons. I mean, it just even on a whim, sometimes, a man would separate himself uh, from his wife and, and that family. Well, that got to be a very big problem. It got to be a very big problem for his wife. It got to be a very big problem for the children. It got to be a very big problem for her life and how she was going to essentially make it in the world, we've already determined that this is a, this is a society that was driven by uh, uh, men that had uh, the, the the rights were given to men, and now even livelihoods those were those were uh, uh, tended to by men, raising households, providing for households, and now these men are finding something eh something they don't like displeasing about this woman. That they have married and they're divorcing and, and, and separating at an alarming rate and they're basically turning her out turning her out her kids just turn them out into the world hey good luck i don't have responsibility over you right now now she's at a loss she is she is thrown upon the uh mercy of society This was hurting all of these wives, and it was hurting homes as well. It was hurting um, relationships. It was hurting futures. I mean, it, it, it was all kinds of things that were happening uh, and breaking down because of these separations of marriages. Uh, these, this going back on uh, your word or oath that you took. We're going to get to that real soon. I don't think it's a coincidence that after Jesus talks about divorce, he talks about oaths, talks about vows, uh, talks about giving your word and living up to your word. Um, but in any event, this was this was starting to be a problem. And so God in the Old Testament, he makes this allowance, this concession, if you will, uh, not to make divorce, uh, uh, you know, acceptable not to make divorce easy but quite the contrary to make it harder to make it be this incredibly sad and solemn process that it's meant to be this breakup of a family uh, and not only that with this now there are stipulations and you, you know you can't you can't divorce a woman and, and and then take her back and then choose to divorce again and then separate again and then and then get tired of that life and choose to have her back in your home and come on this is a person here. This is this is a person. This is a this is a family. This is she has children. I mean this is this is an issue. You can, you can't play around with people's lives that way. 
And so God said, look, all right, from here on out, look, if you're going to divorce, if you're going to commit uh, this, this breakdown of this home, uh, you're going to have to do it in a certain way, and, and you're going to do it that way in order to rein in um, all of the many, many things that happen to go along with divorce. And, you know, to keep it from, uh, you know, running rampant the way it is now. So God says you have to give her a certificate of divorce, a bill of divorcement. Before that, he could turn her out of his house. He could turn her out, dismiss her children for any reason. Once again, all of this meant to be a sorrow, a solemn thing. The seriousness of marriage is now introduced in the law. If I know that this is going to be a, a binding process to divorce someone, that's what it was. This was, you can't remarry this person. You, you have to establish before witnesses um, of what is indecent and all of these things. That was part of the law. Um, if that's what it takes... Uh, to separate myself in this marriage. Well, before I go into this union, before I give my word uh, and, and my oath to take care of this woman and her children in this home, I'm going to take this very, very seriously. This isn't something I'm going to play around with because it's not something I can just end tomorrow and then pick up again the next day. That's why that concession was given. It was not to promote divorce. It was to rein it in. Sadly, uh, today, I, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Uh, marriage and the concept of marriage is taken extremely lightly. Um, we, we no longer see uh, marriage as uh, two people joining a life together. We no longer see marriage as the two becoming one flesh, uh, which is the way it's described uh, in uh in Genesis, for that reason, that a woman will leave her father and mother be joined, um, or no, a man will leave his father and mother be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, we, we don't we don't think about it that way anymore, and it's very very easy uh, to get discouraged, to get upset, uh, to get displeased about things in marriage, about things in marriage too, not even just about uh, your spouse. You can get displeased about marriage itself. And then we end up separating. Again, this certificate of divorce was, was, was the attempt to restore order in chaos. We have reverted now. We haven't moved. Morally. We haven't we haven't improved increased at all in the years and years and years and years of human existence. We're still dealing with and going through the very same things that we always did. And that that's that's where we're coming to once again with divorce in the home. We need to promote the truth that marriage is serious and cannot be played around with. The Pharisees now, when you get to Jesus' time, <clears throat> the Pharisees were reinstituting chaos. Um, they now said, and this is really where Jesus comes in here at the Sermon on the Mount, the Pharisees in Jesus' day said, you can, so long as you give a certificate of divorce, still divorce your wife, win, divorce your kid, divorce your home, separate your home, when and how and where you want to, uh, regardless of the reason. Just so long as you give her, render her a certificate of divorce. That was, that was never the point of, of starting that in the Old Testament. Starting at the Old Testament was so 
that there could be proof before witnesses, that there was this long, arduous process that made you think about the decisions you were making, so that you could try to keep, you could attempt to keep in every way, these families and these homes together. Then we get to the Pharisees, and they've, they've again, reverted back to chaos. Just as we are today, right? Gosh, we just don't move. The, 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 the foolish idea that we're, well, we just don't move. Um, we're still back into introducing some of this chaos. And so Jesus turns it on his head. He says, look, you've been told by the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. You've been told by, you know, by leaders in the temple. You know, that you, all you have to do is give someone a certificate of divorce and you can be divorced and you're free and clear. He says, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and again, remember, you can turn that, turn that. Any woman who divorces her husband, which we're talking about today, right? Any woman who divorces her husband, any husband who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim. Makes her a victim now. Look at that, victim. And he's not, he's not vilifying her. I love that. He's, he's got everything in perspective here. Makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, he's driving home this point that you have taken, and why? Well, we see in Scripture that God doesn't recognize uh, this divorce. We see in Scripture uh, that the, the the breakdown of a home. <clears throat> well, let me start over. We see in Scripture that the the relationship in a home very much reflects uh, the relationship in a church, and the relationship in a church very much reflects the relationship of the triune God. This complete love this closeness, this oneness as one body, one God, one body in Christ, one flesh, husband and wife. And when we begin to break that down, we, we, we begin to break down many different areas of life. When we begin to separate that, we separate many different areas of life, not just the legal union between a man and a woman. And so it's nothing to, uh, this is what Jesus is driving the whole point here. He says, look, you, you've given yourself. You have given yourself to someone to become one home, to become one person, to become one flesh. To separate that, to separate that is, is harmful and hurtful to you and to others. And certainly the way we do it today. Well, say, I just don't feel like being married anymore. Or say, I just don't feel like being in this relationship anymore. Or something gets difficult. Something gets boring. Something gets mundane and monotonous. Yeah. You argue. Don't get along. Well, welcome to the club. People argue. And so what do we want to do? We want to cut and run. It's not what Jesus does. It's not how he lives out his life, certainly when it comes to his forgiveness and his love for you and I. He cares about us. And so we teach reconciliation. You know, unless there can't be reconciliation. You know, Paul talks about that. Paul talks about the fact that if an unbeliever uh, wants to live with, uh, in that relationship, in that union of marriage, wants to live with someone who believes in Christ, do it. But if an unbeliever wants to leave that relationship because of their lack of belief in Jesus Christ, let them do it. Why? Because we are called to live in peace. This is what I think of when I think of people who are abused in a relationship, physically, mentally, emotionally. You are connected to, you are married to someone, if, if, if that's what they're doing, someone who has not given their life to Christ. Forget about what they said. All right, forget about what they said. You can tell the tree by its fruits. Forget about what they said. Whether it's husband and wife, doesn't matter. 
give your life to Christ. You don't make it your job to hurt people. They don't want to go, let them go. Why? Because you're called to live in peace. You're called to live in peace. You want to reconcile? Reconcile. But if they've given up this belief in Jesus, they don't live after the character of Christ. And, and you can't reconcile those two things. You cannot reconcile abuse and giving yourself to Christ. That's a, that's a, that's a foolish statement. If you want to leave, let them leave. If you want to leave, leave. We're called to live in peace. Now, if you have two believers in Christ, you know the drill. You know what Jesus is talking about here. You're married. He says, don't get divorced. Don't get divorced. Work it out. See it through. Remember, a relationship, particularly in marriage, is not a give-and-take relationship. Don't ever think that. Please stop thinking that if that's what you think. It is not a give-and-take relationship. It is a give-and-give -give relationship. That is always the way that works. Always. And so, we're working out. We're put in the time and the effort, the study, and the humility it takes to build that uh, to build that relationship. Now, some may say, well, well, I've been divorced. I've been divorced and I've remarried. What now? Should I divorce my current spouse of course not since when do two wrongs make a right what's your job now your job is to live out that union after the manner in which Christ directs that's your job that's your role that's your responsibility Jesus doesn't hate you yeah something happened that you wish didn't happen. That doesn't mean Jesus hates you. It means we do things we're not supposed to do. We do things we don't even know we're not supposed to do sometimes. And what did Jesus do? He went to the cross. He went to the cross. That's done. Your job now is to live out that marriage, that union, under the direction of of Jesus Christ. That's how that works. Don't overcomplicate it, guys, but don't don't fight it. Don't fight it. Every time, you know, we'll, we'll see a lesson on, on divorce, and every, so many people get into this lesson trying to find the loophole. Well, I hope they teach it in a way that, that makes it such that I never did anything wrong. Well, that doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. We mess up. We mess up. Our spouse mess up. You know how it goes. If we're in a divorce, oh, he's wrong, she's wrong, he's an idiot, she's a jerk, so on, so. The marriage is broken down because both of us have allowed the marriage to break down. And again, I'm talking about a marriage between two people without denying Christ here. I'm not talking about an abuser and an abusee, one who has given up, denied the character of Christ and what was not. Okay, I'm not talking about that. That's what we mess up. We get remarried, live out that relationship the way Jesus designed, the way he wants. You're not gonna, you don't get points rubbed off of your heaven score. Okay? Our screw-ups, our mess-ups, all this stuff, that's forgiven in Jesus Christ if we accept that. Now we live out the commands of Christ because we've given our life to Him. It's a beautiful union, by the way. When two people love Jesus more than they love each other, it is a wonderful, wonderful union. I've seen that. I've seen that play out in marriages of couples' lives my entire life. And it's beautiful. It's not perfect. But it's absolutely beautiful. 
It's a wonderful thing to be a part of. Um, I don't like hearing, of course, about people dying. Um, but there is this, I don't know, feeling I get uh, when I hear about a spouse passing away like if two people come together and live together and been married for 50, 60, 70 years sometimes. And again, I don't, I don't take joy in it, but, but I do think there's something special about it. A spouse passes away and very shortly, I mean very shortly after the other, the other spouse passes away. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. But I, I think there's something to that. I really do. When people join lives together and they choose to stick it out in the hard times, um, and they actually grow together, connected in some way. And, and who am I to rule that out? Um, absolutely loving each other, such when one passes away, the other one, you know, they don't, they don't hurt themselves, but they, 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 their, their body, their lives uh, react in a way that, that they can't go on without. It's a beautiful connection. Um, again, it's not something to be happy about where you know, a couple dies. Um, but it is, it is, I think, something special when we hear of those things. And you've probably heard of those things. I've heard of them actually quite a few times. But that marriage is supposed to be special and it's supposed to be forever. And you're going to have hardship. You're going to have trouble. You're going to. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a given. You're going to argue. You're going to disagree. As Tom Nelson says, I, I don't like a couple that doesn't argue because then you got you got either someone overpowering married to someone who doesn't have an opinion or you have two people that don't have an opinion he said you got a maid married to a butler you don't have a husband and wife in a home you got a maid married to a butler you know, there's going to be conflict and friction there but you don't just call it quits you see it through you see it through and you, that's what Christ talks about here you can't Guys, you can you can you can read through this, and you can hold it this way, and you can hold it this way, and you can you know twist it around and turn it as many times as you want. But the words are still the same. The direction of Christ is still the same. But when we come into this, this when we give our word to share our lives together, that is what we are to live out. And by the way, if you have, if, you know, another person does not determine your value. Sometimes there are marriages that break up because of someone being uh, unfaithful, just as Jesus just talked about here. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, that has happened and may have happened to you. You, you have to know that, that the mistakes of others The desires of others, temptations of others, they do not determine your value. They do not determine your integrity, your purpose, your dignity. Not at all. And I, I know that if, if, if you're listening to this and, and, and a wound like this is fresh, I, I know it's hard to get through. I know it sounds like, feels like the world's collapsing. But that is not your definition of bad stuff that other people do. The unfaithfulness of other people. And if one is, that does not mean all are. One person may be unfaithful. That doesn't mean all people that you meet are going to take their word lightly. It doesn't mean that all people that you meet are going to be unfaithful to a relationship that you had. You still are an incredible 
creation of God, just like me. You are just like me. Just like me. Incredible creation made in the image of God. Okay? So you can continue on with this incredible relationship, not only with your Heavenly Father, not only with your Savior, Jesus, but other relationships that you're going to encounter in life. Give it time. Give it time. He follows this with oaths. He follows this with essentially giving your word. Eh, not really. With oaths, with swearing upon, or swearing by, or swearing through. And, and I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, when we talk about the uh, union of marriage, we are talking about about giving your word. We, we call them vows, don't we? Uh, it's a special thing and a sacred thing. And we do it that way because it is meant to be very, very um, serious, very, very sacred. And so we don't take those vows lightly, at least. We shouldn't take those vows lightly. We should not give them lightly. And that really does kind of feed into now the next section of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, again, you've heard it said to people long ago, do not break your oath but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. You, you could not swear by certain things uh, because it was too great. It was too big of a deal. You, you certainly could not swear by the name of God. Uh, that's something that people try to avoid at all times. Um, and people would swear by other things, affirming their word, right? Affirming truth. You know, I swear by the sun. I swear by the by Jerusalem. Uh, I swear by my head. I swear by you know all this stuff. And they were trying to drive home the point. That what they said was true, and so they would they would carelessly and flippantly swear these oaths before people. Problem is, well, there's a couple problems with this, but but one of the main problems is they were using this not to actually affirm and live out the truth. They were actually using this to deceive others. There were things that they would do, oaths that they would swear, um, you know, never in the name of God so that they could somehow avoid uh, judgment, you know, like they were fooling God. But they would swear by Jerusalem, or they would swear by the altar, they would swear under the, or in the temple or by the temple. I mean, all, all, these, all these crazy things um, to, to make someone believe that what they're saying and what they're doing and what they're telling is true. When in fact it may not have been true, and they may have may have had no intention of living out what they have said and living up to their word. Now here, again, you've heard it said, "Do not break your oath, but fulfill the Lord, fulfill the Lord the vows you've made." But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. And now this is where Jesus gets into some of these examples I was telling you. But don't swear by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by earth, for it's His footstool, or by Jerusalem. For it's the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. This is this is essentially what people were doing, in order to um, to in order to give weight to a falsehood. Um, and it was it was thrown around carelessly. This kind of goes along with uh, throwing these oaths around care, uh, carelessly. Uh, really, I think is related to and goes along with. Uh, the name of God. You know, one of the things that God tells people in uh, the Old Testament law, do not uh, use the name of God uselessly. Do not use the name of God in vain. Uh, do not use the name of God in a careless, haphazard, or irreverent way. And why? Well, because the weight of it uh, begins to crumble. 
the the severity of it, the honor of it. Uh, we no longer revere the name of God because we throw it around so often. Uh, we no longer revere that oath. I mean, how many times, right? You hear people in, in, in the minorest way, you know, the I swear, or I swear before God, or I swear to God. And, and some of the most minor things we encounter in life. What we have done is we have taken the name of God. Here, we have taken the severity of an oath, and we've thrown it away. If you're not going to honor that, if you're not going to honor the name of God, you're not going to honor God. If you're not going to honor the severity of an oath, then you're not going to honor truth at all. Jesus says, just stop. Stop with all this nonsense. Stop with all this stuff. You guys are just looking for loopholes to try to get around things. Stop swearing oaths every other day. I've heard people in the church do this without knowing they're doing it. It gets stuck in my crawl. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. At least know what you're saying. Right? Give some thought to the words coming out of your mouth. Right? I, these are the things we need to do. Jesus says, don't swear an oath at all. Now, is he talking about all oaths across the board? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's really what Jesus means here. Jesus spoke under oath um, before, uh, before the Sanhedrin. It was either before the Sanhedrin or before Pilate. Um, why speculate? I can tell you. Oh, here we go. Uh, Matthew 26. Yeah, Matthew 26, before the Sanhedrin, starting in verse 63, but Jesus remained silent. They were asking him questions. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, in coming on the clouds of heaven. Here is Jesus professing under oath. God swears. God the Father swears by himself in his, in his uh, covenant with Abraham. Swears this oath. Uh, you know, and so he's not going to contradict himself here. Jesus is not going to contradict himself. He's not going to live in a way that he does not teach. Um, God the Father is not going to promote one thing and live out another. Are we talking about any type? Because some people do take this to the extreme. We see this many times in different beliefs. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Jehovah Witness, uh, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist, I believe. I'll have to check on that one. But many do not uh, even form the words swearing an oath. Um, even in the court of law and that type of thing. Uh, and, and, and while their attempt uh, of uh, adherence to the word is, is admirable, I, I think they've missed the point on that. Um, really what's forbidden here is the careless, useless, misleading, irreverent use of oaths in everyday life. And so what does Jesus say to them? He says, just, just get this, forget about this in everyday life. Forget about this, you know, if you're not, whatever it is, taking your marriage vows in a court of law, you know, these types of severe and serious moments. Stop using oaths. Stop using the name of God in vain as you swear upon God. And he says, all you need to say is yes. Or no. He says simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. That's what he says after this. He says anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Or anything beyond this is from evil. That's your yes be yes, your no be no. You know what that requires? It requires that you live up to your word, first of all, 
it also requires that you speak honestly in all situations. I mean, the moment one of those things breaks down, if we, if we, if we don't care or put a premium on honesty, if we don't care about living up to our word, then simply letting our yes be yes no longer carries very much weight uh, when it comes to the the people we're communicating with. Our no doesn't carry much weight when it comes to those people. And so we have to live that out. If we're going to let our yes be yes and our no be no, instead of trying to, you know, uh, approve through our oaths, prove through our swearing to God that what we say is true. But just every time we do that, we diminish the importance of who he is and what he is, but also we diminish the importance of certain times and moments and situations in our life. You know, if I'm going to swear to God about an everyday event, an everyday occurrence, and then I'm going to swear to God to love, honor, cherish, my spouse, it, it, it's not too long before we start blurring the lines of importance. It's also not too long until we start blurring the lines of reverence when it comes to God our Father. Divorce and oaths. Next week we're going to look at uh, retaliation, vengeance, that type of thing. We'll look at eye for an eye. Um, today, divorce and oaths, next week, eye for an eye and love for enemies. These are going to work on your pride a little bit. Some of you. Some of you have, have gotten to this point, in this place, in your walk with Christ, when you hear things like this, and frankly, you understand it. And you agree with it. And you realize it's not easy. And you realize you've never perfected these things. But you're still willing to accept them. Because it's God himself. And and it goes along with this incredible character of who Jesus is. Others, if you're hearing these things for the first time, it is hard to take. It, 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 does, it does really tear into us. Into our pride into our, our, our perceived uh, perfection sometimes. Um, even, even the vessel, you know, uh, it, 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 me as the, as the teacher laying this out, even that sometimes we don't like. Yeah, it happens all the time. We can hear one, two of the same messages from, from two different sources, two different teachers, and one we accept, one we don't. Yeah, that happens. It's part of it. But it is true. And we need to begin to take these things seriously, even if they go against, contradict uh, what we uh, think is easy or what we think is our right. We, we have a, we, we're going to have to talk about that one of these days. We have a very skewed, uh, frankly, wrong idea on what our rights are. Um, but it does go against that sometimes. And so be patient with it. Uh, don't just look at this. Don't just listen to this video. Look at all of the Sermon on the Mount. But even more than that, look at Jesus. Look at his ministry. Look at what he teaches. Look at how he lives. Look at what he promotes. Now go back to his teaching and see if it's just him being a jerk or him being a prude or him trying to get you. No. It's, it's, it's this display of an incredible love and protection that he wants for relationships, for people. It's an honor and respect that we ought to pay uh, to him. Uh, and we see this play out in his ministry as we come to know him better and his character better. So that's divorce and oaths. Next week we're going to get to eye for eye, an eye for eye and love for our enemies. Uh, after that, we get into chapter 6. Um, I, I, I'm still waiting to get to prayer. Prayer is in chapter 6, and I've been looking forward to that section nine weeks ago when we started this, and hopefully we'll get there pretty soon. 
uh, we'll continue up and finish up eventually through chapter 7, and then we'll be done with this series. I don't know how many weeks this is going to take, uh, but we'll be done with this uh, with this study. So uh, talk to friends, family, neighbors, if they're looking for something to study and something to uh, listen to throughout the week. And uh, hopefully, if you're listening to this before Sunday, I'll see you all on Sunday morning. See you then.